Uh, we've seen elements of fragility in our economy. A lot of these have been amplified by inherent structural weaknesses. Uh, 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 the, the inherent social weaknesses have been amplified by the pandemic. If you look at some of the, the, uh, the problems with aviation, for instance, with hospitality, uh, with our education system, for instance, the fact that we didn't move uh, in Anis to make the investments in online and digital learning, now our schools are closed. Children are suffering at home, uh, losing learning. Um, and when you come to the social cycle space, it's the same thing. Uh, we, we, we believe that there's certain underlying structural social weaknesses uh, in terms of support systems, support mechanisms, uh, but also just old stigmas that are now coming to the fore uh, when we begin to live with the reality that uh, uh, mental illness is a, is a conversation that we've refused to have for a very long time. Uh, there have been warning signs in, in, in many families uh, from substance abuse to uh, domestic violence uh, and all of these things should have triggered uh, some concern at the very beginning but they haven't. Now COVID has laid them bare uh, and, and I think the, the conversation we're going to have today so you kind of digging into uh, the elements that we help us construct some kind of uh, realistic understanding and, and appreciate, appreciation of the role public health should play uh, generally in, in, in looking at overall well-being and wellness of our citizens. Uh, how do we make sure that our care systems, uh, our homes, our institutions, uh, places of work, Basically, are alive and aware uh, of some of these uh, of some of these some of these problems. So, I would like to welcome you to make your your presentation. Uh, so, we will listen to you for about twenty five to thirty minutes, and then we'll open it to our esteemed audience to ask questions. And uh, Juki and I will be happy to moderate the Q and A session. So, Professor Koi, thank you very much and welcome. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to, um, I'm sorry, let me just uh, fix this. Um, oh, there you go. All right. Um, oh, it's not sharing now. Yeah, just. Um, Yeah, um, so thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to discuss this important topic. Um, and it's something that I've been speaking about for several weeks since March when COVID-19 uh, visited our shores. Um, I think it is something that has been understated over a long period of time. And in societies that have not been able to set up systems that uh, address mental health during times without crisis, they have a lot more trouble dealing with mental health during crisis, and they have a lot more mental health problems after crisis, such as the, the one that uh, we're facing today. 
Um, I will not say much about COVID-19 because lots has been said about COVID-19 by both experts and those that think they're experts. Um, so today I'll just focus a lot more on uh, concepts of mental health, uh, including commonly used concepts like stress, distress, burnout, moral injury. Um, and then look at what are the risks to mental health that are uh, presented by this pandemic uh, to, to us in this country but also um, globally. After that, I'll also look at uh, the psychological reactions and the outcomes of uh, COVID-19, both at individual level, but also uh, speaking from a societal perspective. And then I'll spend a little bit of time on uh, coping uh, methods and what people can do in order to uh, deal with this pandemic. Uh, I'm not sure the slides are moving. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll dive right through and um, start by looking at what is considered to be stress. I think uh, in everyday conversation, we've had people talking about being stressed. And often, uh, sometimes when they speak about being stressed, often we uh, speak with them and we figure out they are not really stressed because uh, these are the things that constitute what one would call stress. So it's a tension that you experience when you encounter a threat, when the resources available to you for coping are inadequate. So it can be positive in the sense that uh, every waking day, when you wake up in the morning, there are certain things that you must do in order to feel like you're at equilibrium. And if you don't do them, then you feel uh, something is missing and each and every one of those things can be stressful to you and so some of that stress makes you leave the house and go to work and that's a good thing some of that stress makes you uh, move the extra mile to achieve certain things that you're supposed to achieve and that's a good thing and so that is positive because it prepares you to deal with the challenges of day-to-day -day life but it can be negative when it is prolonged or when it induces what we call maladaptive responses uh, many people would have heard about fight or flee as a reaction to threats in our environment. And fighting or fleeing are adaptive responses, they are normal responses to stressful encounters. But freezing is not an adaptive response because when you freeze, uh, then the train will run you over. I mean, you or, or the lion will eat you if you're in the African savanna. So you have to do something uh, for it to be considered adaptive. The panel on the right of the screen shows you the symptoms and the parts of the human person that they affect and um, you know it affects everything when you're stressed it will affect your concentration you might have physical symptoms including headaches anxiety anger uh, problems with your stomach i think people who have had to sit difficult examinations uh, will remember uh, having a need to go to the toilet very many times even if they haven't eaten anything um, fatigue, um, it affects your sex drive, affects skin, can cause irritation, muscle tension. So in other words, when your ability to cope with uh, threats in your environment is overwhelmed and you experience stress, it can affect every aspect of your being. The other word that's commonly used is distress. And uh, psychological distress is a subjective sense of discomfort. And it ranges from normal feelings of vulnerability, you know, when you're in a situation like what we find ourselves in, where 
when you walk out the door, the risk of getting infected is something that people do not know how to handle that COVID-19 is high, you will experience some discomfort. You will experience some vulnerability and that's normal. Uh, feelings of sadness when you have lost something and moves on to fears and to problems that can be disabling such as depression can also cause distress, anxiety can cause distress, extensive worries and culminating in social isolation. So all those are metaphors for, uh, for distress, if you like. Uh, people working in the helping professions, especially, but also those that encounter stressful situations in their day-to-day -day life and in their work, might experience what one calls burnout. And burnout is a state of emotional, physical, and mental exhaustion that is caused by prolonged exposure to excessive stress. So when you have that stress, which is a situation that is overwhelming your coping capabilities, and it is prolonged, and it is continuous, and it is, becomes your life, uh, then you are at risk of developing burnout. And when you're burnt out, you're extremely overwhelmed, you're unable to meet your demands, occupational, social, or any other demands. And the you know, syndrome of burnout denotes a sense of emptiness. You have given all that you need to give, and you have nothing left to give. It's like literally a candle that has burnt out, and there's no more candle to light and burn. And this is related to the concept of moral injury. And here, um, we are talking about injury to your moral values and conscience due to a perceived moral transgression. And this is very common in uh, the kind of work we do in the health sector, where you are confronted with a situation where you have the ability to deal with it, you have the knowledge required, uh, you have the patient in front of you, but then you lack certain things that you need in order to help this person who is in front of you. So institutionally, you have not been provided with the tools to do what you know needs to be done. And as a result, people suffer or people die needlessly in your hands. And if this is happening continuously, several times, you are at risk of developing moral injury. It produces a profound sense of guilt and shame that I could have done more. If only this had happened, I would have done it differently. It may also cause feelings of betrayal. And we've seen a lot of this uh, with the uh, nurses, doctors, clinical officers, accusing government, accusing the employers of betraying them and betraying the people that they're supposed to be helping. You'll see anger, moral disorientation, where somebody doesn't really know. Uh, you know, I've lived my life this long believing that this is right and this is wrong. Uh, was I right? Uh, was there something amiss in my uh, moral compass? And so on the right again, there are the facets of moral injury, which again cut across your entire being, from your emotional repertoire to relationships to the, your self-concept, including uh, your own concept of the world and authority of yourself. And it continues over a period of time, eventually defining who you think and who you believe you are. Having dispensed with those concepts, which um, again, people who have experienced them might have questions at the end of this and would be happy to address. I want to narrow down now. So what are the risks that are associated with the COVID-19 pandemic uh, as we are experiencing it um, today? One of the reasons why COVID-19 poses a huge risk to the mental health of people is the fact that a lot is still unknown. In fact, um, at this point in time, eight months down the road since uh, it was first described. We are still debating about which is the most common mode of spread, uh, which is the best way of preventing infection, how should we manage people who get infected, and a lot of new knowledge is being generated every day, and if you're not in this specialized field of people who follow infectious disease and epidemics as a common monainchi like some of us, then you can be completely at sea. Uh, one recommendation today and next week it has changed and you're wondering why can't doctors get their act together and just tell us one thing that we need to do? But this is a product of continuous, constant research into you know, understanding this pandemic and figuring out how to fix it. COVID-19 presents an unseen threat. Um, I mean, if it was a person out there or an army that is attacking the country, we would know what to do, of course. We would, you know, at the end, we would even build a wall so that they don't get in and we feel safe within our walls. But this threat is unseen, 
this threat is here and we do not know exactly where it is. And this degree of uncertainty increases your risks to mental health. The fact that it is widespread, everyone is affected and the infection might even be in each and every one of our homes, but we do not know and that poses a risk to our mental health. The rapid spread of information. So other than the virus spreading rapidly, information is spreading even faster than the virus or its effects. And this has a good side and a bad side of it. And we will look at that later. But the good side of it is that if a discovery is made today in one of the countries on the edge of this app about how to deal with this virus, within minutes or hours, it will have been known across the entire world. So that's a good thing. But on the negative side, there's also rapid spread of misinformation. So if somebody has a misguided idea about what needs to be done, like I've seen a forward today saying that one of the things that you should never do is to sleep with a scarf or with socks on your feet, and that if you do, then it's a risk to your health, and I don't know how that poses a risk to anyone's health. So, but this information, if I put it out there, uh, by the end of the day, anybody who has links to myself would know that and would think that this is the correct way of doing things. So that is a risk with misinformation and what has come out of the US to be known as fake news. Another system involvement, of course, this virus attacks your, your brain. It, it attacks, thank you, it attacks nerves. And we have seen a lot of mental health effects as a result of that. Uh, direct infection of the nervous system. But also there are effects to your mental health that are related to the illness and death of loved ones. We, we fear that our loved ones will get this and will die. And the current information uh, that seems to suggest that people who are older or people with chronic diseases uh, get more severe disease and are, are at higher risk of death is unnerving to everyone because everyone has a relative who fits that demographic. And initial discussions around, you know, let those who are vulnerable be protected and so on, is looking more and more impractical because in every homestead there are people who are vulnerable. And in fact, the vast majority of those that are vulnerable do not know that they are vulnerable. There are risks to health workers who are on the front line. And, you know, we have had to set up mental health helplines for them because of what they're seeing and what they're going through. The isolation that comes with the control measures that we put together the lack of human contact, uh, the overzealous enforcement, like in this country when we use the police almost in a militaristic fashion to enforce separation of people, achieving the exact opposite effect has serious mental health effects. And then there are the socioeconomic effects, job losses, reduced income, narrowed social support network, all this will affect you mentally. And finally, uh, something that was meant to be positive, where we have closer interaction with family, because we are locked up in many uh, cases, as we have been in the past, uh, instead of increasing cohesion and making people happier, it is increasing the risk to con of conflict and violence, and we have seen an increase in domestic violence as a result of this. So these are some of the things we are learning as we go ahead um, in this pandemic. I have distilled some of the psychological reactions that uh, we have seen and are seeing in relation to this pandemic, as indeed we see in relation to many eruptions in our social, uh, social environment. Anxiety is a big one. Most of the surveys we have carried out asking people, how do you feel at this time? Most of the people have described themselves as being anxious. Self-reported stress. People have said that they are stressed, more stressed now than they have ever been in their lives. People are fearful. There is a lot of uncertainty. And a number of people have demonstrated irritability and anger. I think many of us have seen this even in the public sphere among our own uh, leaders and, and the people we hold uh, in, in, in respect. Importantly, almost all of us have experienced grief. And we have experienced grief for many reasons, uh, many losses, including loss of loved ones, but also loss of a sense of safety, loss of a sense of security, um, all sorts of losses that have triggered uh, grief in our populations. And finally, one of the most important reactions, especially among people who are vulnerable, is that um, this situation can trigger the existing conditions and people are asking uh, do you mean um, 
there was less depression or depression is increasing now or is it just being uncovered uh, how is COVID-19 related to the high numbers of people with schizophrenia that we are now seeing partly is because these people were relatively stable they had adjusted but now with the coming of COVID-19 and the measures associated with it it has triggered these pre-existing conditions I'll spend a few minutes discussing grief because this is the predominant emotion that most people are feeling at this time. And uh, several years ago, most half a century ago, Elizabeth Kubler-Rose described what she then called the stages of death at that time. And she describes them as shock, anger, uh, you know, depression, bargaining, and acceptance. And she describes them in detail in, in publications that she put up at that time. But subsequently, people have seen that it's not only death that triggers this grief reaction. And indeed, it is almost any kind of profound loss that triggers this reaction. And a loss of a sense of safety, of loss of your world, uh, your concept of how the world should work can also result in grief. That's why then it's important for us to discuss these stages, because everybody is along the continuum of dealing with this grief. And at the end of the day, the goal of navigating this continuum is to arrive at the final stage, which we call growth or finding meaning. And so people start out in shock and denial. And I think we have less and less of that now in this country, uh, as opposed to what happened in March and April, when everybody came up with all sorts of conspiracy theories about this thing that is only affecting other people. And I have never seen anyone who has been affected by it. And it's a method for government to make money and steal money and stuff to the current time when uh, almost everybody has seen someone who has been affected and therefore the narrative has to change. It goes on to anger. When you realize that this thing is real, it is here, and there are certain things that could have been done to prevent it, and there are certain people I think are responsible for it, and people express their anger in different ways. This might sink into depression and detachment, and eventually then somebody starts climbing out of that and bargaining with the powers that be, uh, those that are religious that bargaining with their deities, uh, those that have proximity to you know, people in authority, find a reason to bargain with them in order to improve their chances in case they get infected. And we've seen people in this country who are struggling to install ICU units in their houses, uh, obviously thinking that in case they got sick, that this is the bargain they have uh, to improve the chances of survival. And finally, we arrive in a stage of acceptance. And when you accept that this thing is here with us, there are certain things I can do and there are certain things I can't do, uh, then you start exploring options, developing a new plan to cope and to deal with the situation. And the final stage, uh, which has been added in the recent past by people who study these kinds of things, is the stage of growth or finding meaning so that you can look back at the catastrophe that has hit you and store it away in your brain as a memory, an unpleasant memory, but a memory all the same that you can recount without experiencing the emotional content associated with it. These are some of the psychiatric manifestations, mental illnesses that are likely to arise as a result of exposure to this pandemic. And depression is a big one. Uh, under normal circumstances, if you do a survey of the population, you might get 10 to 15 percent of the people who suffer from depression or who have had an episode of depression in their lifetime. In times of crisis, in times of uh, disasters, this prevalence increases significantly because they trigger episodes of depression. Anxiety is also very common and all kinds of anxiety disorders from panic, phobias, obsessive compulsive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder. All of these are common during these times of uncertainty. Substance use comes in because many people will turn to substances to deal with their anxiety, to deal with their depression, to deal with their uncertainty. And that then uh, results in a situation that uncovers people who are at risk of substance use disorders. Other chronic mental illnesses can also be triggered, including adjustment disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder, and so on. Those with children will have noticed behavioral uh, changes, including exacerbation of exa developmental disorders like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, autism, and so on. And as I mentioned earlier, 
it also affects the brain directly and therefore as a result of this attacking the brain directly you might get uh, mental illnesses that result from that like delirium and so on. It is time now for us to reflect a little bit on what is done if somebody um, majority of the people going through this uh, distressing situation what should they do and what needs to be done to help them cope immediately as they start entering this uh, situation and one of the most celebrated interventions globally for people encountering difficulties such as this is called psychological first aid and the beauty of psychological first aid is that the providers do not need to be experts Providers don't need to be mental health experts, they don't need to be doctors or um, trained providers. Anybody can learn to provide psychological first aid and can learn to provide this very quickly because it is repurposing things that we usually do anyway, but then providing them in a more uh, systematic way. So it focuses on ensuring that people's daily needs are met and that information is provided and that people are protected, in this case, from information overload and that those in need of care are linked to care. The panel on the right shows you the components of what you should do. And you begin at the top by looking. Uh, if somebody is in trouble, like somebody has been infected and they're in isolation, you want to think about, do they have food? Do they have water? Are they safe? Do they sleep well? And so on. So just discovering what their needs are, listening to them so that they tell you how they feel, they tell you what they're going through. Providing some comfort, the assurance is very important connecting them to services. If there are people who, you know, if they need to connect to their social circles, there are digital ways of doing that today. Those who want to connect to their religious leaders or to whoever provides them with support, it is part of psychological first aid to connect them to that. Protecting them, and in this regard, protecting them from further exposure, but also protecting them from the kinds of information that increases risks to mental health, as, as we know. So in, our first instinct when somebody tells us that I have been infected is to ask, what did you do to get infected? Uh, why did you take the precautions? But we know people who have taken all sorts of precautions and got infected. So we need to protect people from the sense of guilt that we build in them, that there's something you didn't do or something that you did wrong uh, to get infected. And, and protect them from misinformation that might tell them that if you do one or two things, then you should be out of your house within the next five days, you'll be well because we do not know any of that. Instilling hope is a very important component of psychological fasting. Human beings thrive on hope. Every day in the morning, you wake up and you attack the things that are in front of you because you're hopeful that by evening, you'll have made some achievement. You go to bed every day and sleep peacefully, knowing uh, or hoping that you'll wake up tomorrow morning alive and well and able to face the challenges for the next day. So instilling hope is, a, is an important component of psychological fasting. For workers on the front line, including journalists, including health workers, including security uh, officers, debriefing is an intervention that we have designed to, to address their fears and anxieties. And how this happens is that it has to be organized. There's an organized team that is going to do something that they have been trained to do, and therefore they know what they're anticipating as the risks. They prepare how they will handle those risks. And in the evening or a day or two later, they sit down as a group and they discuss how they handled it and they discuss the challenges that they met and they discuss how that made them feel or any psychological reactions and then they deal with that as part of debriefing. Debriefing is useless for people in the general public who are not members of an organized intervention and in fact can be dangerous for them because it uncovers certain feelings that you have to be prepared to handle. But for organized responders, it is extremely useful. Importantly, if I, there's nothing else anybody takes from this presentation, is that during times like this, it is important to find reasons to be hopeful. And none of us can sit down and list all the reasons everybody in the world can have to be hopeful. All this depends on your environment, depends on the circles that you find yourself in. As I approach conclusion, I would like us to spend a couple of minutes just looking at how to deal with grief, because we have said that grief is one of the biggest risks during this time. And so we came up with uh, this schematic representation of some of the things you can do depending on the stage of grief that you find yourself in. And it is relatively uh, intuitive, if you like, 
but then it is good to put it out there so that you know where you are. If you're in denial, the risk is that you will not take this thing seriously and therefore you are at risk of getting infected or infecting others if you are infected yourself. And there is a column on how to get help. Uh, make every effort to seek out accurate information. It doesn't make sense uh, to engage in long arguments about what you think is right and what you think is wrong. Because at the end of the day, it is irrelevant what kinds of arguments you engage in if the information out there is at variance with the information that you have. And the aim here is to increase your knowledge so that you can be more adaptive. If one is angry, we know the obvious risks, harm, and uh, it is important then to find a safe environment in which you can talk and express yourself, examine why you're angry, and find ways of redirecting the energy so that you can process whatever it is that you have lost and incorporate it into memory, and so on and so forth through the bargaining stage when you need a supportive environment, a listening ear uh, to help with coping strategies. Bargaining is not a very good coping strategy because you're sitting here bargaining with whoever it is you're bargaining with, but the virus doesn't listen to you, it's doing its thing. Um, so you need to find other coping strategies that are more adaptive. Uh, if you go into depression, then it will affect your social and occupational functioning. And then this is a time to bring in your social support network, find somebody that you can vent to, um, and they help you to cope with whatever is dragging you down. The goal being that you must accept the loss and plan for the future. And if you reach acceptance, if you reach that too soon, then people might think you're out of touch with reality because why are you so calm and happy and things are going on out there that are causing distress to everyone else. I think at this stage then you need to get support so that you can consolidate whatever you have learned and implement whatever plans you have for the future with the goal of growing and finding meaning from, from grief. It might sound pretty cynical for somebody who is at the beginning of grief to tell them that at some point in future, you will find meaning and you will find a reason to move on uh, after this difficult time. Some of the do's and don'ts, um, get information from trusted sources. Maintain connection with social supports. This cannot be overemphasized. Find reasons to be happy. Eat well, sleep well, rest. Cliched, but true. Physical and mental exercise. Find something to do to help. If, if you're helping other people, uh, what we have found in research is that doing things to help other people are actually extremely helpful to the helper. So if you have done a lot of stuff for people during the day, when you go to bed, your mind goes over what you have done during the day and finds satisfaction in the fact that you're still a useful human being. And that has huge mental health benefits. Be kind. I think um, we take this for granted. But unfortunately, not everyone is kind and not everyone is inclined to be kind. So we have to remind you that you should be kind because everybody is going through a tough time. On the other hand, don't use substances to cope. When you're stressed, don't drink, don't smoke because you're stressed because it doesn't help with the reason why you're stressed. It might soothe and cover over it. But when its effect is finished, the stress comes back in double force and it doesn't help at all. Do not fear seeking help when in need. Right now, there are people who are waiting for people to seek them out to help. And there are people who have set up systems to help. And it only takes asking. And you'll find people in your environment who can help. Do not overindulge even in things that are healthy, including sleep and food, because then the effects of this will be seen after the pandemic, when you find that there are some clothes that do not belong to you anymore, for instance. Do not focus too much on tracking the numbers of COVID-19. Let, let the experts do that. That's their job. Let epidemiologists track those. Um, if you focus too much on this, you're doing a job that's not yours, you're not prepared for it, and it will just cause a lot more distress. Do not overwork. The fact that you're working from home or in an unfamiliar, unusual environment doesn't mean that you should do more than you usually do. Pace yourself. Do the same amount of work you're expected to do, even if you are going to the office. Um, and if you overwork, if you overdo it, you will do very well for a short period of time. And after that, you will be worse than useless to yourself, to your family, and to your work environment. Importantly, do not take on responsibilities that belong to others or worry about things you cannot solve. Because when you do so, again, you carry a load 
that doesn't belong to you and it will eventually crush you. As I finish then, I will leave you with this mental health continuum model that uh, runs from the green side, which is healthy, through the yellow side, which is reacting, the orange to the red, where you are sick, and some of the things that you can do to know where you are and take action before it is too late. When you're healthy, everything is going on well. You should keep focusing on the task at hand. At the bottom of this panel, shows you to break problems into manageable chunks. It's called problem solving. And identify and nurture your support systems. Maintain a healthy lifestyle. When you're reacting, you're starting to get nervous, you're starting to get trouble sleeping, and you're starting to get some symptoms. You need to recognize your limits. Get adequate rest, food, and exercise. Engage in healthy coping strategies that we have discussed. Identify and minimize the stressors. When you're injured, it means you are no longer healthy. This thing has affected you and you're now unwell. You have anxiety, fear, restlessness, fatigue. You are keeping to yourself a lot more. You need to identify and understand your own signs of distress. Find somebody to talk with non-judgmentally. Seek help from professionals and seek social support instead of withdrawing. Finally, if it has overwhelmed you and you're sick, you're extremely anxious, depressed, unable to sleep, uh, exhausted, and so on, then you need to see a professional, seek consultation as needed, and follow the instructions that you're given by your health provider until you regain your physical and mental health. So if there's nothing else you've learned from me today, and this is something you can take home, it applies whether it is during a pandemic or during uh, usual times when you're going through life as usual, but it is a helpful guide for you uh, when you're going through potentially stressful events. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to take questions. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Foley. That was quite succinct, and I'm sure it will be reflected in the questions that we will be receiving. I think there's a lot of uh, questions, and if I may start with uh, a question from Malin. Uh, so Malin is asking a question about mental health and pregnancy. Uh -huh. And she's saying that with data indicating less preterm births, uh, which is often stress-related, as well as less postpartum depression uh, and better adherence to breastfeeding uh, in COVID times, what could be the underlying mechanism? Mm -hmm. Because again, uh, this could be some of the, the, uh, the places where we would expect that stress will be manifested, uh, yeah. especially amongst pregnant women. Mm -hmm. Malin says uh, the data is counterintuitive to what we would generally understand uh, yeah to be the outcomes among pregnant women? I, I can think about, um, I am sure stress is one of the factors related to preterm births and adverse uh, pregnancy and childhood outcomes. And, and so it could still be there and, and it could still be a factor. However, there are many other things that are related to the intervention to COVID-19 that have been potentially beneficial. So for instance, the issue of uh, people staying at home, those that could, staying at home a lot more has allowed mothers to spend a lot more time with their children. Um, uh, it has allowed better conversations in families and, and so on. And so in my view, uh, the other measures, rather than the absence of stress, might explain better outcomes. And I would leave this to the epidemiologists that study uh, maternal and child health. Uh, to map this out and to find what are those other factors that are associated with the better outcomes during this pandemic. Uh, however, stress is there. Um, and, and importantly also, if families are staying together a lot more, theoretically, it should help to reduce stress if uh, you know, there are families that are well adapted, well adjusted, and they speak with each other and they support each other. So there are multiple factors that could explain better uh, maternal and child outcomes during this pandemic uh, than just the absence of stress. Thank you. Um, spoken like a true prof, that was a very um, brilliant presentation. There's a question here from Anil Hamis, um, and it's essentially about um, reopening as we slowly ease into um, reopening and, you know, 
you know, coming to terms with the new normal. Anil is asking, um, what would your advice be on schools reopening, the role of teachers to support uh, mental health uh, promotion and building uh, the resilience of, of children? Um, because we are talking about mental health for adults, but we're talking about the impact of the pandemic on adults, but what about children? How do you build that resilience and what would your advice be on the reopening of, of schools? So uh, two parts to this. The first part is, what do I think about reopening of schools in general at this time? Um, it is my opinion that uh, when, if, if a uh, government decided to close up things and then slow down things so that there's less physical interaction between the citizens and therefore reducing the risk of transmission, the decision to change that uh, should be based on multiple factors, including evidence that the risk of transmission is lower or that can be controlled based on the measures that have been put in place. Um, and so that is something that uh, whoever is making the decisions on closing and reopening needs to uh, take into consideration. And having said that then, I would say that if a system is completely closed and starts phased reopening, the very last institution to reopen would be schools. Because schools cannot reopen uh, while public transport is restricted. Schools cannot reopen while uh, other group interactions are restricted. And therefore, whoever is making that decision must ensure that by the time schools are reopening, the public transport system, the economy itself, where to buy things, shopping, whatever it is that, that people do on a day-to-day -day basis, is also reasonably accessible so that um, it would mean that measures have been taken to deal with any potential surge that can uh, happen after reopening schools. And therefore, when children go to school, no matter what measures you put in place, children will mingle, children will uh, you know, be close to each other. And therefore, we are ready to deal with that, the outcome of that, then we can reopen schools. And when we do that, uh, for the education sector, teachers and managers of schools, you must understand that it is not going to be a normal reopening of schools. You have to prepare weeks and months in advance before you reopen schools. And the preparation includes psychologically preparing the teachers so that when they go back, they are in a frame of mind that is less anxious and better prepared to deal with the anxieties that the children are going to bring to the school. So they have to be psychologically prepared themselves uh, and how to handle each other as teachers and managers of schools. And then they have to go through a preparation on how to deal with the anxiety that is coming with the children, because children are coming from varied homesteads, and some homesteads are a lot more anxious than others. And children's anxiety is infectious, both to other children and to adults in the environment who might not know what's going on. So this has to be very deliberate. There are programs, uh, some of which are available online, to prepare teachers on how to deal with children and the anxiety that children have when they come to school, how to answer questions around COVID-19 that children will have that increase their distress, um, and importantly, how to set up the school system so that it is closely linked to a health system in case there's an emergency related to this COVID-19. So I agree that uh, reopening is not a snap decision that you say we are reopening on Monday next week. It is something that you have to program and say, we will reopen in the next two months. And in that two month period, we are preparing to be able to handle the psychological reactions of the teachers, the psychological reactions of the children, and the health risks that come with having children mingling among themselves and mingling with adults, some of whom you know, might be coming from places that are high risk as well. So the next question, Rukoi, is directed to you and I. Mm. person asked the question is wondering whether there are any social or mental health benefits that have been triggered by COVID-19 and whether we are going too much on the other side and disseminating negative effects and ignoring some of the positive mm -hmm. outcomes uh, yeah. from this pandemic. Yeah. So maybe we'll start and I can jump in and ask some comments. Um, it's, 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 it's a good question, and um, it's, it's, it's a question that's very relevant now, but would have looked like a, a terribly morbid uh, question 
uh, under any other circumstances other than COVID-19. Because when people get, and get sick and there's a threat to public health, it is often important for those of us in the health sector to look at the potential risks, potential harms, so that we can prepare them, prepare to deal with them, and, and ensure that they don't have as much damage as uh, they, they, they could. And the reason is that uh, when we are planning, we plan and must plan for the worst. Even if we are hoping for the best, we must plan for the worst case scenario so that it doesn't happen. And the only reason it will not happen is because we were better prepared and because we planned for it. So many people who say that health people and public health practitioners are preoccupied with negatives, it is because necessarily by nature of their work, they must be preoccupied with the absolute worst outcome so that then they can tell you what you need to do in order to prepare for it. However, those uh, of us who do a bit of epidemiology and uh, follow, and I think you've heard also from uh, Malin, uh, looking at some of the things that can be described as positive outcomes, including uh, reduction in other uh, infectious diseases. I think the burden of other infectious diseases has reduced and the hospital use in some places has reduced, hopefully because people are less sick, uh, because they are cleaning up a lot more. Um, and then most infectious agents travel from your hands to your face to your mouth. And if you're preventing that, then you reduce the risks. Uh, there has been a lot more public health awareness in the general population than would have been the case without a pandemic of this magnitude, so that's positive. There has been a lot of innovation in uh, the work environment, for instance, discovering that there are certain things that we have been doing at work that we don't really need to keep doing or that we can do differently and more efficiently. And this has come to light because of this pandemic. We have come to the realization of our connectedness as human beings. And the fact that you cannot be an island hiding in a very rich enclave and that you will not be touched by public health threats. Uh, we have realized that what happens in Madari slums affects the guy in Mutaiga. What happens in Fiji affects the guy in New York. And therefore, we have to worry about the health of everyone on the planet if we are going to be safe from pandemics like this. So there have been, there have been a lot of positives. And one, another thing is, COVID-19 has come like, a, like what you call a cleanser, if you like, something that cleans off the grime, something that uh, opens up carpets that have, are hiding a lot of grime underneath. Um, so they have, it has exposed a lot of the fallacies we've had, not only in the health sector, but also in our social interactions. It has exposed the lie that uh, you can leave public health to market forces, for instance. And it has emphasized the role of elected governments, why we elect governments, is to guarantee our health. And therefore, there has to be some collective contribution to protecting our health, uh, rather than leaving it to what people call market forces. It has exposed a lot of these uh, fallacies in our developmental paradigm. It has exposed the fallacy that people need to have skyscrapers and live in tall buildings and in concrete jungles in order to be productive. And it has demonstrated the need for us to have more open spaces to have people closer to their families, even as they work, and, 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 and so on and so forth. So I think there are many positives we will take from this, many lessons we will learn from this that will be useful to human interaction uh, into the future. Thank you. So I think Lukwe has covered most of the points, but I just want to emphasize uh, a few things because I'm kind of writing a paper on COVID-19 as an adaptive challenge. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the interesting innovations that we see in education, for instance. There's a lot of innovation that we're seeing in, uh, in the retail sector. Uh, we've seen remodeling of economic uh, and, and, and business models uh, across many sectors. And I think we're also seeing almost like a tipping point in some of the, uh, uh, the uh, kind of, the many aspects of socioeconomic life that we took for granted. And we didn't challenge some of the assumptions. Uh, for instance, uh, questions around uh, education, one size fits all education. I think uh, online and digital learning is creating an opportunity for more massive, more significant learning. Uh, we've been talking for many years about uh, education that focuses on the individual space of learning. I think with online delivery, we now get an opportunity to go to something that most of us were very, very skeptical about in, in, in education, the flipped classroom. 
where the professor is not the sage on the stage, but the, but the sage on the, uh, the, the guide on the, on, on the side. Uh, so it basically gives agency, the students go home and work on, pro, on, uh, on, on, on the cases. And we come back and discuss in a classroom setting most of what would have been done at home as homework. So you're basically giving agency to the learner, helping the learners to pace themselves out much better. So I think it's, it's open that box in terms of how we redesign uh, uh, our instructional methods, how we reframe the relationship between teachers and, and students, uh, for instance. In the retail sector, we've seen more home deliveries, uh, the big stores, the supermarket, and the malls are basically things that we were creating. Uh, they were not going to serve uh, critical purposes in driving economic enterprise. Uh, so we're now creating much more nimble economic uh, systems, especially around retail. Global trade is now going to a much lighter footprint. Uh, we're basically rethinking supply chains, reimagining the structure of industrial uh, reorganization. So there's a lot of uh, positive uh, outcomes that are coming out of this. And I think a lot of innovations are born out of these critical tipping points at every junction uh, in economic and social development. Thank you, Alex, for that. Um, so let's talk about stigma. Um, and we talk about it you know, along two tracks. So the first track is for the frontline workers, the health workers, the people um, at the frontline, including even journalists, some of whom have contracted um, this disease in the course of their work. Yeah. So there is the issue of, of, of stigma. First of all, Majid and um, Nora are asking, um, how do you handle, uh, you know, at the work situation, how do you handle stigma um, for people who have contracted COVID-19 and, and recovered? Um, so that's the first track as you handle stigma. Then the second track, um, talks about um, mental health being considered a taboo in some communities. And you were just having this discussion with you and Alex and I, um, when you're talking about mental health not yet being recognized as a public health um, issue. So this is really a taboo subject that you're talking about, that COVID is making us to um, discuss it. So what advice, what strategy would you give people to start talking about mental health, sharing the stories for those who have gone through that. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and yes, so stigma, uh, the study of stigma uh, for a long time uh, has been a part of what we do in mental health because mental ill health is a heavily stigmatized uh, area in our lives. Uh, so I begin with the first, firstly looking at stigma in general. Stigma is a, is a construct that is made up of uh, at least three components. And the first component of stigma is ignorance. Uh, people operating on lack of knowledge. So ignorance used positively, not, not as a insult, but as a fact that you do not know uh, about a particular subject. And so you operate from a point of lack of knowledge. The second component of stigma is prejudice, which might emanate from your lack of knowledge. And so you develop certain beliefs and certain attitudes about a person or a group of persons um, that might not that is not useful in social interaction and therefore results in the third component of stigma which is discrimination that is the behavioral outcome of, of the ignorance and the prejudice where you now set aside people or groups of people and say that they are an out group and they're different from us who are the in group and they should be treated differently from us so stigma is a product of that triad. Um, and it is true that in situations where there's a lot of fear and anxiety and uncertainty, the stigma thrives because there's less knowledge. Um, people have formed attitudes in the past which they then cluster onto this new uh, situation they find themselves in. And in the belief that they're keeping themselves safe, they might start discriminating against others. And so among health workers, we are seeing uh, health workers on the front line who are getting infected uh, with COVID and uh, then they go home or they, they are treated and they recover. And when they come back to their workplaces, some of their colleagues are treating them uh, differently in a discriminatory way. Um, and yet we've had this discussion before that COVID-19 is an infection. And when you get the infection and recover, chances are 
but you have some degree of immunity, even though we don't know how long it will last and how much it protects, but you're different from a person who has never been infected with COVID-19 in the sense that you have some degree of immunity. In that regard, then, it is my thinking that a person who has been infected and recovered is safer, way safer than somebody who either has not been infected or who has not been tested. So we do not even know your status. And so if there was going to be any segregation, I would be putting people who have never been tested or never been infected aside until I discover whether they have been infected or tested. And then we deal with them going forward. And so it doesn't make sense in the health setting to treat your colleagues who have been infected differently. In fact, they're very safe and they're the ones who, in my view, uh, should be uh, advising the rest of us on how to deal with, with this pandemic. Uh, coming to, and, and I, I think that the strategy in the public sphere on uh, stigma against COVID-19, the strategy must address the three pillars that I mentioned. So where there's ignorance, we must flood knowledge. That is, we must give information that is accurate, information that is timely, that addresses concerns and fears of people, and that starts chipping away at stigma. Where there's prejudice, we must model the desired behaviors and desired attitudes. And so you've seen uh, the ministry officials when they're making announcements, uh, one would expect that because they're influencers in the traditional sense of the word, that they should then model the behaviors that people should, should engage in. So if you hear a high, gov high ranking government official calling a person who has been infected with COVID-19 a victim, they are perpetuating prejudice. If, if, if you know, calling, uh, saying that somebody is transmitting this virus, you are perpetuating prejudice, rather than thinking about somebody contracting it on the other hand, and so on and so forth. Where discrimination comes in, uh, you deal with discrimination by having clear codes of conduct and having clear ways of interacting that discourage uh, discrimination. In our societies and traditionally, one way of doing this was through creating taboos. Uh, these are positive taboos, like if somebody has been infected and you treat them differently, you're doing something wrong. Uh, so those kinds of taboos that uh, discourage people from treating people badly uh, would come in handy in, in, in the stigma against COVID-19. When it comes to mental health, I think um, this COVID-19 pandemic has revealed to us, what we, I mean to everybody else, what we knew for a long time. We knew, for instance, in this country that a conservative estimate of people who suffer significant features of mental ill health would put it at around 10% as a conservative estimate. But most community surveys that we have done uh, put something like anxiety disorders at up to 40% of the population. Uh, they put depression at up to 15 to 25% of the population. They put more severe uh, mental illnesses like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder at two to 3% of the population. Any other condition, if it had physical stigmata, the physical features would have been taken as a crisis. But because these mental illnesses happen hidden in our inner world of being, they are not considered to be a public health problem. It is my view that, and I have said this publicly, that we need to worry about this because there are many people in positions where they are making very important decisions that affect every one of us, and we do not know their mental health status, and they fall in the same category of 10, 15, 40% who will have some features of mental illness in their lifetime. We must worry about this because the effects are not only on the individual, but they're on society as, as a whole. We must make it easier for people to talk about their mental health. We must uh, make it such that if somebody is feeling low, they can say, today I'm feeling low, and that's okay. It's okay to feel low because people feel low every once in a while. And if it is overwhelming you to be able to say, I am feeling a bit overwhelmed, I need help, and that should be okay the same way if I broke my arm. I can go to a colleague and say, I broke my arm and I need to, to get some help. So those conversations um, need to be encouraged. Those conversations um, need to be had. And, and institutions like uh, AKU, institutions um, like government, ministries and departments must have forums where people can go freely and discuss their inner world of being and their mental health without being judged and without being treated differently.
That is the only way that we're going to chip away at the stigma that is directed towards mental ill health and the stigma uh, against some of the challenges that we get uh, in, in, in our day-to-day -day life. So a question from Joyce Wangu is on the, uh, the daily COVID updates. Yeah. Uh, the numbers, mm. with the CAS and PS and CAS uh, keep serving the public. Mm. Mm. Uh, and, and whether these are part of the, the, uh, the, the amplifiers of anxiety. Okay. And should we not provide this information Okay. Or if we should, how should we provide it to make sure that it, it, it does not uh, unduly amplify the levels of anxiety, yeah. even though it's information that we need? Yeah. I think this has been a recurrent question in, in many conversations around COVID-19. It's been a recurrent question that uh, should government continue providing this information, which for some people, it is exacerbating the anxiety. And I answer it in, in, by looking at information as a product that has a producer and a consumer. Um, it's just like water. It's coming from somewhere and somebody uses it. It's just like milk. It's coming from somewhere, somebody uses it. So if you look at information in that regard, then you cannot argue that there's too much information. The information is available for those that want to consume it. And therefore, it is important for those that have information, especially around this pandemic, both about its magnitude the risks it uh, poses to us, uh, the harms and, and what government is doing to deal with it, what other individuals are doing to, are doing to deal with it. It is important that this information is available to those that want to consume it. Anxiety is exacerbated on the consumer side rather than on the producer side. So we as consumers of this information must ration how much of it we are consuming because too much of it will definitely cause anxiety. And since we know the sources of that information and we know the media in which that information is being provided, we can ration our consumption of that information by only going to their sources or the media when we need an update ourselves. So we can go and check, we can decide that I'll be checking once a day on the Ministry of Health website to see how things are going. And then you go on with the rest of your life. You can decide I'll be tuning in during the Ministry of Health updates and listening, and that's all the COVID information I'll get in the day. Another person might decide that in the morning he's tuning in to CNN, he's tuning in to Al Jazeera, he's tuning in to CNK, KBC, and tracking this online and so on, and that person would consume more than he can handle. Therefore, it is a consumer that needs to pace themselves. I would urge government to be as transparent as possible, to give as much accurate information as possible, and to have it in multiple media where people can access them when they need that information. That is not overload. The overload is on the side of the consumer. If I go and make a huge ugali in my house and I eat all of it and get a tummy ache, I cannot accuse Unga Limited of producing too much Unga. It is myself who is not pacing myself. So that's how I deal with it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we are talking about social and physical distancing yeah. don't go to house parties um try not to club try not to meet mm. your friends and most importantly um don't go see your mom she mm. is aging and so we have two questions here from felistas Mujiri and nora mataka felistas mostly uh, well they're asking more or less uh, the same question um so this social distancing can lead to loneliness you know, isolation and all that, and which can, well, further lead to poor mental mm -hmm. health. Mm -hmm. um, what's your advice on that, especially for people who are not able to see their aged parents, mm -hmm. relatives, mm -hmm. children, even for our parents who are not able to see us? Mm -hmm. How do we handle this as a society? I think COVID-19 in that regard is a, a terrible, terrible thing to happen to human society. Um, I, I study evolutionary psychology and evolutionary biology. And uh, one of the things I have learned is that we as a human species have become successful and been able to spread across the face of the earth because of our ability to socialize, our ability to cooperate, and our ability to form social structures that then achieve more than an individual could achieve on their own. And we know that societies 
that interacted. So there, there was an evolutionary process where societies that were more cohesive and able to cooperate were more successful than those that were individualistic and uh, people lived on their own and so on. And over time, we have therefore evolved to have a very strong sense of social connectedness. And that has allowed us to achieve way more than we could have achieved individually. And therefore, COVID-19 threatens that connectedness. And that is why it is so difficult for us to conceptualize a world in which we stay apart from each other. And therefore, um, we know that this period has to come and it has to pass because we will not be human without hanging around in groups and doing things together. The first thing I do is to discourage the use of the word social distancing. Social distancing is discouraged. I encourage social solidarity. Social doesn't mean that in the same physical space. Social means you are connected to other humans, no matter where they are, using whatever tools are available to you. So we are not encouraging social distancing. For social distancing would, it would mean isolating yourself and not being in touch with anybody else. We do agree with the physical distancing for a time until you know we get a vaccine or until uh, this pandemic runs over or whatever but we must retain the hope that a time will come when we are able to get together again as human beings and share the same physical space because without that we will no longer be the humans we know today and therefore my advice is uh, find alternative ways of remaining connected if you can't be in the same space physically find other ways of remaining connected. And technology has come in to try and fill that gap. Um, you know, phone calls, Zoom, video calls, whatever it is, if that can at least reduce the distance between you and your loved ones, I think then you should use it. There's a nice story of a colleague of mine who got infected with COVID-19, had to isolate herself in, in her house, in her bedroom, and her children were in the next room, but they couldn't see her because of the risk. And uh, they innovated in the sense that they would have an evening when they go into Zoom and uh, share experiences and talk the same way they used to talk when they were in the same physical space. It wasn't exactly the same thing, but it was far better than no contact at all. So in my view, it is important to maintain human connection because without it, I agree with the people who are asking, without that human connection, we will disintegrate as human society. We cannot survive without remaining in touch with other humans. So the, the next question is asking Dr. Okoye your view on uh, including psychosocial support for discharge of recovered COVID-19 patients mm -hmm. and their family members. Yeah, well, I, think, I think it is absolutely indispensable. Uh, in the past, we have argued that any health service that is set up must include mental health and psychosocial support as a core component of that health service. COVID-19 has shown that it is completely indispensable. Um, you've seen people who get infected or, or people asking so, so and so got infected and uh, was told to stay at home and after staying at home for 14 days is now being told he can go out there and mingle with other people but nothing has been done for him so what, what treatment has been given to this person those are questions that are born out of the fact that we haven't had sufficient mental health and psychosocial support because other than the illness being a physical illness, it has a huge psychological component. When you get it, you do not know if you'll be the one who will get a hypertensive storm and die. You do not know if you're the one who will be newly diagnosed with diabetes because of COVID-19. You do not know if you're the one who will get the respiratory problems people are getting and suffering from. So that has a huge toll. And every day that you are told you are still at risk is a heavy load to carry for the average person. My colleague who uh, also one of the leaders of the doctors associations also got infected and was in the house and everybody would say, you know, he's strong, he can handle it. We had several conversations with him and one of the things he said is that there are times he would wake up at 3 a.m. Maybe with an itch in the throat, yeah. coughing a little bit and he would say, yeah, it has now come. 3 a.m. I'm alone in the house. What if I get difficulty breathing right now? Who's going to help? The huge psychological toll that that has, even if somebody is asymptomatic, must be addressed through organized mental health and psychosocial support services. So I, I do think now 
and going into the future as we organize health services, mental health and psychosocial support must be at the core of those services, whether they are for TB, whether they are for HIV, for malaria, for cancer, for anything, mental health and psychosocial support is indispensable and COVID-19 has shown us that. Thank you. Um, so you're talking about, you know, seeking help and the question here is at what point should they seek help? So Masi um, here is saying that um, she's asking at what point should one consult a psychiatrist? Um, she's currently on uh, Alprazolam, I hope I got that right, mm -hmm. prescribed by a GP, but, I, but she has over the past couple of days been experiencing um, panic attacks. She, um, she says she's also doing CBT. Mm -hmm. That's one question. Related is um, Nicholas Oma, who's you know asking a more general question um, about the diagnostic process um, for you know we don't want to call them victims, but mm -hmm. people who are um, battling with mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And he's asking, are there public support structures or sources of information mm -hmm. and guidance for those who may need them? So I think maybe you can tackle. Um, the two questions. Right. Thank you very much. So uh, when should you seek help? Um, so mental health is a spectrum, uh, starting from people on one end who are perfectly okay, they are adjusted, they are doing well, they sleep well, they interact with other people well, they're achieving their life goals. Those are on the other end of people who you can say are perfectly mentally healthy. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have people who are suffering from mental illness. And in between is the majority of us. So there's a, you know, a degree of distress somebody might have on and off, or somebody might be having early symptoms of mental illness, or somebody might have you know, more chronic mental ill health. And the best judge of when you need help is you, the individual. When, when there are changes in your environment, when you notice things are different, and you're having difficulties coping with things that you used to cope with easily, that might be time to seek out a professional and ask them if you're doing okay or if there's a problem. And, and this, it might not be easy because often these changes come upon someone gradually over time. But the moment you notice that you're not able to achieve your goals in life, there are certain things you've decided you need to do and you're unable to do them. You're not getting as much sleep as you feel you need. Your appetite is changing and you're not able to eat as much as you need or maybe you're eating way more than your usual. Uh, those are times that you might want to seek out a professional and uh, explain to them how you're feeling and what you're going through in order that they determine whether you need help or not. And when I say a professional at that stage, often uh, you can see, uh, uh, you know, a clinical psychologist would be able to make a diagnosis and determine what kind of help you need at that stage and whether you need to see a psychiatrist or not. If you have a psychiatrist available, if you see a psychiatrist, they're able to make a diagnosis and determine whether you need to see a psychologist or a counselor or whether you need to continue with care at the level of a psychiatrist. And so the system is meant to be set up so that whichever point you enter the system of care, you should be channeled to the place that has a solution for you. So in summary for me, looking at the mental health ecosystem, uh, it starts with yourself, understanding yourself and being able to deal with some of the things that come to you using self-talk, uh, being physically healthy, uh, keeping your mind busy and so on. It moves on to the family that is immediately around you who would notice changes in you that uh, they find strange or find different from who you usually are. And they can provide early support by listening, asking if there's anything wrong and providing support at that level. And as it goes further, you have a network of friends. If you have a social support network, they could also play the same role of an extended family. And then beyond that, then we would need them to introduce professionals. And we have counselors who provide counseling services. And counselors would help you to deal with the stresses of day-to-day -day life. The difficulties that you might encounter in day-to-day -day life, a counselor can help you navigate that by helping you to identify resources that are available to you that you can use to deal with those stresses of day-to-day -day life. As we move to a more, uh, you know, more distressing symptoms and, 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 and events in your life, a clinical psychologist can make a diagnosis, uh, even if it's of a mental illness, and can fashion interventions that include psychological treatments, that is the psychotherapies, and advice on social interventions that can help you to get better. And then if this uh, becomes more uh, severe, 
then you would require intervention uh, of a psychiatrist who would also be able to make a diagnosis, would be able to advise on the psychological interventions required, but would also be able to advise on social interventions that are required. And ultimately, if any medication is required, then the psychiatrist is able to prescribe that medication. So that is a kind of ecosystem that is meant to be in place to support people who require mental health services in our society. Uh, often it is not set up perfectly like that, but that is the aspiration uh, that, that is there. In the absence of sufficient numbers of clinical psychologists, sufficient numbers of psychiatrists to cover the entire population, then we have the medical doctors or other general practitioners who have been trained to identify and manage or initiate management of common mental disorders in the population. And therefore, they should be able to help and then refer appropriately where they feel that a person needs more specialized care. I am not able to uh, comment about individual treatment plans, but uh, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, the medication and so on, are all strategies that are used to deal with a variety of mental health problems. As long as they are prescribed based on a diagnosis uh, that is verifiable, and the, their treatments for something that uh, you know is agreed between the practitioner and the patient, then they are legitimate. Um, that's as far as I can say about that. When it comes to the diagnostic process, I think I've handled a, a bit of that. But in Kenya, in the public health system, um, every public hospital uh, today is considered to be a mental hospital. So a person who is experiencing mental or psychological distress ought to be able to walk to the nearest county hospital or national hospital and be directed to a place where they can get help. So that is how it is set up. You might not get psychiatrists in every hospital or counselors or psychologists in every hospital, but you should have somebody in every, each one of those facilities who can then link you to the service that you need within the public health system as well. And my expectation at uh, AKU, at, um, at, at our hospitals as well, and our health system is that it also has a network where you can be linked to people to provide psychological services and eventually to psychiatrists when you need them. Thank you very much. So yes, this will be the last question. Uh, this is from Mohammed, and his observation is that with increasing infections, healthcare work workers are getting uh, highly overwhelmed. So mm. could you comment on compassion, fatigue, and at what yeah. point should healthcare workers seek help? Yeah. Thank you very much. I think uh, that's, 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 that's an important point uh, you raise. I think um, since the beginning of this pandemic, uh, we have characterized healthcare workers as the equivalent of soldiers in the theater of war. And uh, so they're at highest risk of getting infected, but then they have to be there and they have to be there to help other people because this is what we are trained for. Uh, when we're training doctors, we don't train doctors, believe you or me, we don't train doctors to deal with the uh, mild headaches and uh, to deal with the uh, coughs and colds that will come and go and, and you know mild symptoms. Doctors are trained to deal with emergencies, and there's no greater emergency in our time than this pandemic. And doctors are trained to handle this. Everything else they do is usually in preparation for dealing with emergencies such as this. Uh, and the same applies to nurses. The same applies to any health worker who has gone through a training program. They are trained to recognize emergencies and to deal with them. So they're very well trained and they can deal with it. However, they're human. And being human, uh, they get to a point where their coping resources are overwhelmed, just like the normal other, other people. Their, their threshold might be higher, but it will be reached eventually, especially in the context of this pandemic. And therefore, as we set up services for health workers, we must recognize that they also get psychological distress. And as we send them out there to go and protect us and to deal with this threat, we have to put in place mechanisms to provide them with mental health and psychosocial support as well. For health workers on the front line, somebody is asking when should they go and seek help? Uh, they should seek help from day one. In other words, the system should be set up so that they have access to debriefing, they have access to mental health and psychosocial support uh, on a regular ongoing basis. You should have a line that you can call and just unload and say, wow, today was a terrible day. I lost a patient. There should be a line that you can call and have a mental health worker on the other end to listen and help you deal with that challenge in the day. So when you seek help as a health worker during this COVID-19 uh, crisis, from day one, 
And that means that those of us who are designing these services must then ensure that each and every frontline health worker has access to this kind of support. Yeah. So um, just the very last question. I know you're running out of time, but it's not every day that we yeah. <laughs> um, have a conversation on mental health. There's a question here from Agnes Mugo, who is asking, when should a COVID-19 recovered patient get worried um, now that you know there are reports that it affects the brain directly? Are there any red uh, flags mm -hmm. that one should look out for? I thought that would yeah. be quite yeah. important to yeah, so uh, what I would tell somebody who has recovered from COVID-19 is that uh, our hope and the current state of knowledge is that the worst is behind you. So that is the state of mind I would go around with after recovering from COVID-19. I will continue taking the usual precautions, I would continue protecting myself and others from further infection, but I would walk around with the attitude that the worst is behind me, being positive. And that is one of the things that helps you to insulate you against some of the risks that you're likely to face after recovering from COVID-19. Indeed, the virus attacks the brain, but it doesn't attack everyone's brain. Um, just the same way it attacks the lungs, but it doesn't attack everyone's lungs. Just the same way it affects the circulatory system for some people, but not everyone, and so on and so forth. So uh, being vigilant means listening to your body, and if you feel things are changing, you are a lot more lethargic, uh, your thinking is getting different, you are not having sleep, you are uh, having difficulties doing some of the tasks that were easy for you in the past, it is okay to seek a consultation, to get investigations done, just to make sure you're okay. But it doesn't mean that everybody who gets infected will have some brain involvement. Just like it doesn't mean everyone who gets infected will have lung or kidney or liver or heart involvement. So just be on the lookout, listen to your body, and when you feel like your body is not behaving the way you expect it to be held, uh, seek out a professional to do an assessment and advise you on the way forward. So thank you very much, Professor Tuli, for taking the time to thank you. Uh, make this presentation and to engage with uh, colleagues who've been uh, listening very keenly. Uh, you can see from their questions that yeah. uh, there is a fair amount of engagement. Yes. People really care uh, about mental health. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the fortunate things that might come out of this is that this becomes, uh, gets to the fore mm -hmm. of public health discussions, yes. uh, public health policy. And again, the question is really around how do you move mm -hmm. away from hospital, mm -hmm. highly medicalized approaches to dealing with this to a more community-based approach, family-based approach uh, that basically looks at community health as a focus yeah. uh, for healthcare service delivery. Uh, we've seen in events of pandemics, hospitals are really completely overwhelmed. Yeah. In many cases, like in the previous experiences with Spain, Italy, mm -hmm. they became the, the, uh, the epicenters of spread. Yeah. Uh, I think we've dealt with that a little differently in, uh, in the second wave after Europe. Uh, but I guess the, the, the real question is how we how do we start to move the policy needle yeah. around mental health as a critical service delivery? Mm -hmm. uh, every hospital uh, in the country from level five going downwards, how do we make sure that uh, we have sufficient resources, mm -hmm. sufficient help, and we start to move towards destigmatizing yeah. mental health? Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much. Yeah, thank uh, you. We hope our colleagues will uh, feel free to engage with you more directly. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're very grateful for your time. Uh, this afternoon with the presentation. Thank so our uh, colleagues out there, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Okay.